Hello, everyone, and welcome wherever you are today. Thank you for joining us and being a part of this Lenten experience. Welcome to our first Wednesday from Sanctuary Studio A here at Trinity Lutheran Church in Stillwater. Obviously, this is not as we expected this day to go, and uh, we know that it's been a disruptive and diseasing time uh, for everyone. And we're doing our best to keep each other safe right now and to take the advice and the needs of our neighbors seriously. During this period of social distancing, we are trying to keep connected as much as possible and continue to be the church and be the body of Christ because we need to be in community. So our plan is to continue with our regularly scheduled programming, but in our own places and gathering online. It's forced us to be creative and adaptive, which I think is God's invitation and opportunity for us right now. So thank you for your, uh, for your adaptive work right now. Um, we also know that God is at work working through us and so many to alleviate the suffering of COVID-19. So today we'll have a short worship and message from Reverend uh, Grant Stevenson and hear a little bit about how our faith and our vote are linked together as people of faith, that we live out our faith as citizens of this world and also as children of God. Please join us as you feel comfortable and God's peace to you during these uncertain times. I'll invite you at this time to join with me in the call to worship, which is uh, up on the screen for you. As darkness gives way to light and winter sleeps to fresh beginnings, we come tonight to be reminded of God's love for us. Like the green shoots of renewed life stirring beneath the soil, we welcome an awakening of God's word in our lives. In this time of reflection and learning, we affirm our identity, we claim our security as children of God. We come to be reminded of who is our neighbor and how to be a neighbor. Let's sing.
Let us pray. O Lord, our God, in a world torn apart by fear and suspicion, teach us, your children, that That love love is the the only means to conquer fear, the The love we encounter as as we search you out, the love we encounter as we we accept your embrace. O Lord Jesus Christ, in a world full of anger and frustration, teach Teach us, your siblings, to overturn the tables and tear down the fences which which turn turn away away the hungry and homeless, to feed and house the disciple that knocks on our door in the guise of the stranger, and to find the love we seek in loving others. O Lord, Holy Spirit, Mother of Wisdom, teach Teach us, your children, to be caring of one another, to protect one one another, as you gather the nations under the feathers of your wings. Help Help us to know know peace that that steals gently in in through quiet quiet acts acts of kindness. kindness. Amen. We'll hear from Grant now. Hi, my name is Grant Stevenson, and um, Pastor Chris asked me to be a part of your series uh, this Lenten season, which I'm really um, thankful for and, and thrilled about. Uh, I was actually looking forward to being with you tonight um, at Trinity, but we're going to do it this way uh, because we're um, we're all hunkered down in the midst of this coronavirus, and I'm I'm glad that we are. Uh, what we're doing is uh, protecting the people in our community who are the most vulnerable, um, particularly the elderly. And I'm I'm uh, I'm shocked how many people are thinking of me in that group, uh, but I don't. In any case. We're gonna um, we're gonna do our best and all stay hunkered down. I grew up in Stillwater, actually, and uh, know lots of people there still. And uh, Trinity was a congregation that I participated in a lot as a as a kid. My ma- my family was members of one of the other Lutheran churches, uh, but I loved it at Trinity. My dad's side of the family uh, was uh, was from Trinity, and um, and we just buried uh, Helen Fawley, a, a dear dear friend of mine uh, from from Trinity just a couple of weeks ago, so I participated in a service with Pastor Chris uh, at that time. So for the friends of mine uh, in the in the congregation, hi, and I um, haven't seen you in a long time, but uh, it's nice to be here at least, at least virtually with you. Today's um, topic is um, voting as an act of faith. Um, maybe Pastor Chris asked me to do this because I've been really active in a number of organizations, uh, including now, that encourage uh, people to take their values and take their um, deepest convictions and bring them into the public arena, into, into public life. And the most basic way to do that, the most accessible way for most of us, is, is by voting. That might seem... Uh, to some people like an odd subject for uh, a sermon, a sermon during Lent. Uh, But I don't think it is. And I also think that um, not only is it an appropriate subject, it's deeply embedded in our roots um, as Christians and in particular as Lutherans. Martin Luther uh, talked about the, uh, he referred to two kingdoms. Now keep in mind, Martin Luther lived uh, during a time which was not a democracy. He lived in Germany, and Germany was run by a series of uh, princes. And the other powers that uh, that were in Europe and in Germany at that time were the were the Catholic Church. And so Luther talked about um, two two kingdoms, both of which belonged to God: the kingdom of the world and the kingdom. Of the church, and so that he talked about two different kinds of rulers. We don't even use that word, thankfully, anymore uh, in an American democracy. He talked about two kinds of rulers, and the one kind were the ones who ruled the church, uh, the people who are governing the church and clergy, uh, for sure. And he talked about princes, the people who ruled the in the realm in the realm of the world. But remember, Luther lived in a time when. Uh, there was no democracy. So how would we take that kind of thinking 
and apply it to our situation, which couldn't be more different and I couldn't be more thankful about in an American democracy. Really, if we're going to make use of Luther's thinking at all, that makes all of us, all of us who are eligible to vote, all of us who are old enough to vote, that makes us the princes. Collectively together, we are the prince. And so we have the same responsibilities that Luther would have demanded of a Christian prince. We have the same responsibilities to be active uh, in building the kind of world that uh, Luther would have talked about and we have talked about forever uh, as the kind of world where, that is good for our neighbor. That's the main category for a Christian. What is good for my neighbor? What helps my, what helps my neighbor? And then actually one more example I learned in seminary, and I kind of forgot about until recently, but I really love this. Um, after the, what is now the state of North Dakota was, um, was settled, which meant awful things had happened uh, to the indigenous uh, communities. Um, after that time, the authorities started talking about what kind of immigrants should we uh, encourage come from Europe. And the answer was, we have to bring uh, folks from Scandinavia. I think that they were speaking uh, specifically of Norway. But it wasn't because they were Norwegians. It was because they were Lutherans. And they said Lutherans build their churches on Main Street. What was the point? Their point was, they're the kind of Christian who understands that part of their role in the world, part of the way that they are in the world, those Lutherans in Northern Europe, is to build the community and make a good community and make a place where people can live and thrive and relate to each other. That's our heritage as Lutheran Christians. Our heritage is understanding that it's our job to create the community. So how do we do that? I think what it means is that when we look at going to the voting booth, first the first thing we, the first thing we acknowledge is we have to vote. We ought to vote because it's our duty. It's actually our job. Now, in America, we usually use different words for that. We talk about voting as a right. And in our country, thank God, it is. It is your right to vote. But a Christian would have a slightly different perspective on it. It's not simply a right. It's an obligation. It's an obligation to say, as uh, a person who understands that I'm responsible, in a democracy, for what this community looks like, for what this state looks like, for what this nation looks like. As a person who's responsible as a Christian, I must vote. So we take it pretty seriously. I think maybe we've gotten a little bit casual about that. Lots of people are feeling cynical, well, my vote doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter really um, what, I, <clears throat> what I have to say. I would have to say, that that is um, not a great way for a Christian to think, about, to think about voting. If you think about the fact that you're in charge of what, the, what, of what happens in this community. So the very first thing I would say is, one, we have to vote. The second thing is we have to start thinking about who do we vote for? Now this series and this conversation we're having today actually isn't partisan in terms of how we normally think about partisan politics in, uh, in the United States. That is, we think of parties, Republicans or, or, or Democrats usually. There are a few other parties as well. We think in terms of parties. But a Christian doesn't begin there. A Christian begins with a set of values. And I would like to suggest uh, two tiers of values for Christians and voting. I think before, today, before this week, I might have only thought of one, but I want to talk about a different one first. Here's the first tier, confidence. The very first thing a Christian would want to be looking at is, can I elect someone who is competent? I feel like we are living in a time where it's become increasingly obvious to all of us that this is a high value. Whether, uh, no matter what party you tend to align, align yourself with, so, for example, I just want to say, um, in Minnesota, we are having uh, a robust and a thoughtful and a courageous response to the coronavirus because, on the whole, we have elected competent people. When I listened to our 
uh, Commissioner of Health. Her name is Jan Malcolm. Uh, at a press conference yesterday, I was thinking, she is so confident. Ms. Malcolm uh, used to be the CEO, I believe is what they call her, called her, of health partners. I don't know what party uh, she affiliated herself with before our governor appointed her Commissioner of Health. Commissioner of health. And I don't know that it would have mattered to him because what he got in that commissioner was someone who was competent. So the very first thing I think as Christians, when we consider that our, our communities and our state and our nation can face times like we're facing now, times of crisis and times, uh, times of emergency, we need, to, we need to make sure that we are voting for people who are competent because it keeps us and all of our brothers and sisters safe. The second thing, the second criteria, I would think, in terms of a Christian taking my obligation, taking my responsibility to vote, is to look at what are the core values that someone who is uh, asking for my vote, what, what, are their, what are their core values? I think for Christians, it's pretty clear that the core value for us is that we understand that every person in our community, every person in our state, every person in this country, and to be clear, every person on earth is a sibling. They are our brothers and sisters. So when I go to vote, when I go to take my holy obligation of voting, I need to ask myself the question, who are my siblings and what do they need? It's not wrong to ask the question, who am I? And what do I need? The commandment, by the way, is to love our brothers and sisters as we love ourselves. So it's not wrong to ask the question, what do I need? What does my family need? But I do think a Christian has an obligation to take a broader view. What are the needs of my children who are in school? Don't have any children in school? That's wrong. You do. They're all your children. What are the needs of my brothers and sisters who are in the intensive care unit. Don't think we have any brothers and sisters in the intensive care, care unit? You do. That's our basic confession as Christians, that these are our brothers and sisters. What are the needs of the people uh, who are of the age in this country who could be sent to war? Don't have any people like that in your life? You do. They're all the people who are of that, who are of that age. What are the needs? of the generations to come after me in terms of what kind of planet that they need to live on, what kind of um, environment they need to live and to thrive. Don't have anybody that you know in the next generation and the one after that and the one after that? You do. They are your brothers and sisters. I believe that that's the Christian ethic and we make our best prayerful uh, decision about who to vote for based on what are, the, what are the things that my brothers and my sisters are going to be needing. That's a, that's a basic rule of thumb, I think, for me as a Christian who votes. So three things. We have an obligation to vote because we are the princes in this country. We are the people who decide how this country will look, how our state will look going into the future. Number two, there will be times of crisis and competence matters. And number three, what are the needs of my brothers and my sisters? And by the way, that's everyone. I'm really glad to participate in this conversation with you at, at Trinity. It feels like a little bit of a homecoming, even though I'm sitting here in my house uh, in St. Paul. I'm glad to be participating in this conversation. And I'm glad that you're having this conversation about uh, Christian participation in public life and Christian participation in voting. It's a lot of what I've been working on in my life for 20 years, and I'm really happy to be involved in this conversation with you. I would love to continue this conversation uh, further. There's a lot more we could talk about. There are debates that we could have, and I think that they're worth, and I think that they're worth having. But in the meantime, I do hope you're having a blessed Lent. And God bless you and your congregation, and God bless your pastor, who is really a fine human being, and I appreciate so much her uh, asking me to be a part of this. Bye-bye.
Let's pray. Loving and holy God, we find ourselves in such a confounding time as if the electoral process wasn't confounding enough. Now we find ourselves facing uh, a real threat to the health of our neighbors and our loved ones. We give thanks for the reminder that they are all our siblings, no matter who a person is, no matter where they live, no matter what they believe or what they value. They all belong to us. We belong one to another. And we give thanks for this opportunity to continue to be the church in all circumstances. As we move through this time, we pray for wisdom. We pray for safety and good health. We pray for healing for those who need it. And we pray for all kinds of creative and inventive ways to continue to be community and to be church. And as we imagine finding our way through to the light on the other side of this health threat, we ask that you continue to move through the, your church, that we can be leaders in how to shape a community in which we can all thrive. Help us to act faithfully and engage in public life, to show up to vote, to be part of the process. Help us to raise up competent leaders who can keep our whole community well and watch over each sibling. And help us to continue to remember day by day all the people we encounter that we see on the news, that we drive by on the street, that we stand six feet away from in the checkout line, to look on them as your beloved and our beloved. Bless all who are watching this, that they continue to find ways to connect with you, Holy One, in this holy time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, siblings in Christ, wherever you are, know that your church family loves you. And let us claim the freedom Christ gives us by his self-giving on the cross. May Christ enable us to serve together in faith, hope, and love no matter where we are. Now go in peace, give thanks, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Bye-bye.